the world of the Hellenistic kingdoms, 323 to 223 BCE. Autocratic power became a regular feature of those Hellenistic monarchies and was part of Alexander's political legacy to the Hellenistic world. His vision of empire no doubt inspired the Romans, who were, of course, Alexander's real heirs. But Alexander also left a cultural legacy. As a result of his conquests, Greek language, Greek art, Greek architecture, and Greek literature spread throughout the Middle East. The urban centers of the Hellenistic age, many founded by Alexander and his successors, became springboards for the diffusion of Greek culture. While the Greeks spread their culture in the East, they were also inevitably influenced by Eastern culture. Thus, Alexander's legacy included one of the basic characteristics of the Hellenistic world, the clash and fusion of different cultures. In just 12 years, Alexander the Great conquered vast territories, dominating lands from the west of the Nile to east of the Indus. He brought the Persian Empire, Egypt, and much of the Middle East under his control. However, the united empire that Alexander created by his conquest disintegrated after his death. All too soon, Macedonian military leaders were engaged in a struggle for power, and by the year 301 BCE, all hope of unity was dead. Hellenistic Monarchies Eventually, four Hellenistic kingdoms emerged as the successors to Alexander. In Macedonia, the struggle for power led to the extermination of Alexander the Great's dynasty. Not until 276 BCE did Antigonus uh, Gonatus, the grandson of one of Alexander's generals, succeeded in establishing the Antigonid dynasty as rulers of, the Macedonia, of Macedonia and Greece. Another Hellenistic kingdom emerged in Egypt, where a Macedonian general named Ptolemy established himself as king in 305 BCE, initiating the Ptolemaic dynasty of pharaohs. A third Hellenistic kingdom came into being in 230 BCE, when Attalus I declared himself king of Pergamum in Asia Minor and established the Attalid, the Attalid dynasty. The Seleucid kingdom in India, by far the largest of the Hellenistic kingdoms, was founded by the general Seleucus, who established the Seleucid dynasty of Syria, which controlled much of the old Persian empire from Turkey in the west to India in the east. The Seleucids, however, found it increasingly difficult to maintain control of the eastern territories. In fact, the Indian ruler Chandragupta Maurya created a new Indian state, the Mauryan Empire, in 324 BCE, which we have discussed earlier, and drove out the Seleucid forces. His grandson, Asoka, extended the empire to include most of India. A pious Buddhist, Asoka brought and sought to convert the remaining Greek communities in northwestern India to his region. The Seleucid rulers maintained relations with the Mauryan Empire. Trade was fostered, especially in such luxuries as spices and jewels. Seleucus also sent Greek and Macedonian ambassadors to the Mauryan court. Best known of these was Megasthenes, whose report on the people of India remained one of the West's best sources for information until the time of the Middle Ages. Political Institutions the Hellenistic monarchies created a semblance of stability for several centuries, even though Hellenistic kings refused to accept the status quo and periodically engaged in wars to alter it. At the same time, an underlying strain always existed between the new Greco-Macedonian ruling class and the native populations. Together, these factors created a certain degree of tension that was never truly ended until the Roman state to the west stepped in and imposed a new order. Although Alexander the Great had apparently planned to fuse Greeks and Easterners, he, he used Persians as administrators, encouraged his soldiers to marry Easterners, and did so himself. Hellenistic monarchs who succeeded Alexander relied primarily on Greeks and Macedonians to form the new ruling class. Even those Easterners who did advance to important administrative posts had learned Greek. All government business was transacted in Greek and had become Hellenized in a cultural sense. The Greek ruling class was determined 
to maintain its privileged position. Concerning Hellenistic cities, cities played an especially important role in the Hellenistic kingdoms. Throughout his conquests, Alexander had founded new cities and military settlements, and Hellenistic kings did likewise. The new population centers varied considerably in size and importance. Military settlements were meant to maintain order and might consist of only a few hundred men strongly dependent on the king. But there were also new independent cities with thousands of inhabitants. Alexandria in Egypt, for example, was the largest city in the Mediterranean region by the first century BCE. Seleucus was especially active in founding new cities, according to one ancient writer. Quote, the other kings have exulted in destroying existing cities. He, on the other hand, speaking of Seleucus, established so many that they were enough to carry the names of towns in Macedonia, as well as the names of those in his family. One can go to Phoenicia to see his cities. One can go to Syria and see even more. End quote. Hellenistic rulers encouraged a massive spread of Greek colonists to the Middle East because of their intrinsic value to the new monarchies. Greeks and Macedonians provided not only recruits for the army, but also a pool of civilian administrators and workers who contributed to economic development. <clears throat> Even architects, engineers, dramatists, and actors were in demand in the new Greek cities, many Greeks and Macedonians were quick to see the advantages of moving to the new urban centers and gladly sought their fortunes in the Middle East. The Greek cities of the Hellenistic era were the chief agents in the spread of Greek culture in the Middle East, as far, in fact, as modern Afghanistan and India. The Greeks' belief in their own cultural superiority provided an easy rationalization for their political dominance of the eastern cities, but Greek control of new cities was also necessary because the kings frequently used the cities as instruments of government, enabling them to rule considerable territory without an extensive bureaucracy. At the same time, for security reasons, the Greeks needed the support of the kings, and after all, the Hellenistic cities were islands of Greek culture in a sea of non-Greeks. Alexander died unexpectedly at the age of 32 and did not designate a successor. After his death, his generals struggled for power and eventually establishing four monarchies that spread Hellenistic culture. They foster trade and economic development. Again, you had the Aetolian League, you had the Potomac Kingdom, the Antigonid Kingdom, uh, the Pergamene Kingdom, the Seleucid Kingdom, the Achaean League, and the Marian Empire. The importance of trade. Agriculture was still of primary importance to both the native populations and the new Greek cities of the Hellenistic world. The Greek cities continued their old agrarian patterns as well-defined citizen body owned land and worked it with the assistance of slaves. But these farms were isolated units in a vast area of land ultimately owned by the king or assigned to large estate owners and worked by native peasants dwelling in villages. Commerce expanded considerably in the Hellenistic era. Indeed, trading contracts linked much of the Hellenistic world. The decline in the number of political barriers encouraged more commercial traffic. Although Hellenistic monarchs still fought wars, the conquests of Alexander and the policies of his successors made possible greater trade between East and West. The two major trade routes connected the East with the Mediterranean. The major route proceeded by sea from India to the Persian Gulf and then up to the Tigris River to Seleucia on the Tigris. Overland routes from Seleucia then led to Antioch and Ephesus. A southern route also began by sea from India, but went around Arabia and up the Red Sea to Petra and later Berenice. Caravan routes then led overland to Coptos on the Nile, thence to Alexandria and the Mediterranean. An incredible variety of products were traded, gold and silver from Spain, salt from Asia Minor, timber from Macedonia, ebony, gems, ivory, and spices from India, frankincense, Frankincense used on altars from Arabia, slaves from Thrace, Syria, and Asia Minor, fine wines from Syria and Western Asia Minor, olive oil from Athens, and numerous exquisite foodstuffs, such as the famous prunes of Damascus. The great trade, however, was in the basic staple of life, grain. Social life, new opportunities for women. One of the noticeable features of social life in the Hellenistic world was the emergence of new opportunities for women, or at least for upper-class women, especially in the economic realm. Documents show increasing numbers of women involved in managing slaves, 
selling property, and making loans. Even then, legal contracts made by women had to include their official male guardians. Only in Sparta were women free to control their own economic affairs. Many Spartan women were noticeably wealthy. Females owned 40% of Spartan land. Spartan women, however, were an exception to the rule, especially on the Greek mainland. Women in Athens, for example, still remained highly restricted and supervised, although a few philosophers welcomed female participation in men's affairs. Many philosophers rejected equality between men and women and asserted that the traditional roles of wives and mothers were most satisfying for women. But the opinions of philosophers did not prevent upper-class women from making gains in areas other than that of the economic sphere. New possibilities for females arose when women in some areas of the Hellenistic world were allowed to pursue education in the traditional fields of literature, music, and even athletics. Education then provided new opportunities for women. Female poets appeared in the 3rd century BCE, and there are instances of women involved in both scholarly and artistic activities. The creation of the Hellenistic monarchies, which represented a considerable departure from the world of the city-state, also gave new scope to the role played by the monarch's wives, the Hellenistic queens. In Macedonia, a pattern of alliances between mothers and sons provided openings for women to take an active role in politics, especially in political intrigue. In Egypt, opportunities for royal women were even greater because the, because the Ptolemaic rulers reverted to an Egyptian custom of kings marrying their own sisters. Of the first eight Ptolemaic rulers, four wed their sisters. Ptolemy II and his sister wife, Arsinoe, Arsinoe II, were both worshipped as gods in their lifetimes. Arsinoe played an, an energetic role in government and was involved in the expansion of the Egyptian navy. She was also the first Egyptian queen whose portrait appeared on coins with that of her husband. Culture in the Hellenistic World Although the Hellenistic kingdoms encompassed vast territories and many diverse peoples, the diffusion of Greek culture throughout the Hellenistic world provided a sense of unity. The Hellenistic era was a period of considerable accomplishment in many areas, literature, art, science, and philosophy. Although these achievements occurred throughout the Hellenistic world, certain centers, especially the great cities of Alexandria and Pergamum, were remarkable. In both cities, Alexandria and Pergamum, cultural developments were encouraged by the rulers themselves. Rich Hellenistic monarchs had considerable resources with which to patronize culture. The Hellenistic age produced an enormous quantity of literature, most of which has not survived. Hellenistic monarchs who ha held literary talent in high esteem subdivide, uh, subsi subsidized writers on a grand scale. The Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt were particularly lavish. The combination of their largesse and a famous library with more than 500,000 scrolls drew a host of scholars and authors to Alexandria, including a circle of poets. Theocritus, from 315 to 250 BCE, originally a native of the island of Sicily, wrote little poems known as idols, or dealing with erotic subjects lovers' complaints and pastoral themes expressing love of nature and appreciation of nature's beauties. In the Hellenist Hellenistic era, Athens remained the theatrical center of the Greek world. Tragedy had fallen by the wayside, but a new style of comedy came to the fore. New comedy completely rejected political themes and sought only to entertain and amuse. The Athenian playwright Meander, 342 to 291 BCE, was perhaps the best representative of new comedy. Plots were simple. Typically, a hero falls in love with a not-really-so-bad prostitute, who turns out eventually to be the long-lost daughter of a rich neighbor. The hero marries her, and they live happily ever after. In addition to being patrons of literary talent, the Hellenistic monarchs were eager to spend their money to beautify and adorn the cities within their states. The founding of new cities and the rebuilding of old cities provided numerous opportunities for Greek architects and sculptors. The buildings of the Greek homeland, gymnasia, baths, theaters, and of course temples lined the streets of these cities. Both Hellenistic monarchs and rich citizens patronized sculptures. Thousands of statues, many paid for by the people honored, were erected in towns and cities all over the Hellenistic world. Sculptures traveled throughout this world, attracted by the material rewards offered by wealthy patrons. As a result, Hellenistic sculpture was characterized by a considerable degree of uniformity. Hellenistic artistic styles even affected artists living in India. 
While maintaining the technical skill of the classical period, Hellenistic sculptors moved away from the idealism, idealism of 5th century classicism to a more emotional and realistic art seen in numerous statues of old women, drunkards, and little children at play. A Golden Age of Science The Hellenistic era witnessed a more conscious separation of science from philosophy. In classical Greece, what we could call or would call the physical and life sciences had been divisions of philo philosophical inquiry. Nevertheless, by the time of Aristotle, the Greeks had already established an important principle of scientific investigation, empirical research, or systematic observation as the basis for generalization. In the Hellenistic age, the sciences tended to be studied in their own right. One of the traditional areas of Greek science was astronomy, and two Alexandrian scholars continued this exploration. Aristarchus of Samos, around 310 to 230 BCE, developed a heliocentric view of the universe, contending that the sun and the fixed stars remain stationary, while the earth rotates around the sun in a circular orbit. He also argued that the earth rotates around its own axis. This view was not widely accepted, given that this was in the um, uh, 3rd century BCE. However, uh, most scholars clung to the earlier geocentric view of the Greeks, which held that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Another astronomer, Eratosthenes, Eratosthenes from 275 to 194 BCE, determined that the Earth was round and calculated its circumference at 24,675 miles, within 200 miles of the actual figure. A third Alexandrian scholar was Euclid, who lived around 300 BCE. He established a school in Alexandria, but is primarily known for his work titled Elements. This was a systematic organization of the fundamental elements of geometry, as they had already been worked out, but it became the standard textbook of plane geometry and was used up to modern times. By far the most famous scientist of the period was not Aristarchus, it was not Eratosthenes, it was not Euclid, it was Archimedes. 287 to 212 BCE, Archimedes of Syracuse, or Syracuse. Archimedes was especially important for the work on the geometry of spheres and cylinders and for establishing the value of the mathematical constant pi. He was also a practical inventor. Of course, he was very fascinated with water displacement. He may have devised the so-called Archimedean screw used to pump water out of mines and to lift irrigation water, as well as a compound pulley for transporting heavy weights. During the Roman siege of Syracuse, he constructed a number of devices to thwart the attackers. According to Plutarch's account, the Romans became so frightened that if they did but see a little rope or a piece of wood from the wall, instantly crying out that there it was again, Archimedes was about to let fly some engine at them, they turned their backs and fled. Archimedes, is, Archimedes and his accomplishments inspired a wealth of semi-legendary stories. Supposedly, he discovered specific gravity by observing the water that he displaced in his bath and became so excited by his realization that he jumped out of the water and ran home naked, shouting Eureka, which means, in Italian, I have found it. He is said to have emphasized the importance of levers by proclaiming to the king of Syracuse, or Syracuse, give me a lever and a place to stand and I will move the earth. The king was so impressed that he encouraged Archimedes to lower his sights and build defensive weapons instead. Philosophy new schools of thought. While Alexandria and Pergamon became the renowned cultural centers of the Hellenistic world, Athens remained the prime center for philosophy. After Alexander the Great, the home of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle continued to attract the most illustrious philosophers from the Greek world, who chose to establish their schools there. New schools of philosophical thought reinforced Athens and its reputation as a philosophical center. Epicurus 341 to 270 BCE, the founder of Epicureanism, established a school in Athens near the end of the 4th century BCE. Epicurus believed that human beings were free to follow self-interest as a basic motivating force. Happiness was the goal of life, and the means to achieve it was the pursuit of pleasure, the only true good. But the pursuit of pleasure was not meant in a physical, hedon hedonistic sense, as our word Epicurean has come to mean. Pleasure was not satisfying one's desire in an active, gluttonous fashion, but rather freedom from emotional turmoil, freedom from worry, freedom, the freedom that came from a mind at rest. 
To achieve this kind of pleasure, one had to free oneself from public affairs and politics. But this was not a renunciation of all social life, for to Epicurus, a life could be complete only when it was based on friendship. His own life in Athens was an embodiment of his teachings. Epicurus and his friends created their own private community, where they could pursue their ideal of true happiness. Another school of thought was Stoicism, which became the most popular philosophy of the Hellenistic world and later flourished in the Roman Empire as well. It was the product of a teacher named Zeno, 335 to 263 BCE, who came to Athens and began to teach in a public colonnade known as the Painted Portico. Hence the name Stoicism, from Stoa. Like Epicureanism, Stoicism was concerned with how individuals find happiness. But Stoics took a radically different approach to the problem. To them, happiness, the supreme good, could be found only by living in harmony with the divine will, by which people gained inner peace. Life's problems could not disturb these people, and they could bear whatever life offered. Hence our word, Stoic. Unlike Epicureans, Stoics did not believe in the need to separate oneself from the world and politics. Public service was regarded as noble, and the real Stoic was a good citizen and could even be a good government official. Both Epicureanism and Stoicism focused primarily on human happiness, and their popularity would suggest a fundamental change in the Greek lifestyle. In the classical Greek world, the happiness of individuals and the meaning of life were closely associated with the life of the polis, or the city. One, founded, one found fulfillment in the community. In the Hellenistic kingdoms, the sense, of that, the sense that one could find satisfaction and fulfillment through life uh, uh, fulfillment through life in the polis had weakened. People sought new philosophies that offered personal happiness, and in the cosmopolitan world of the Hellenistic states, with their mixture of peoples, a new openness to thoughts of universality could also emerge. For some people, Stoicism embodied this larger sense of community. The appeal of new philosophies in the Hellenistic era can also be explained by the apparent decline in certain aspects of traditional religion. Religion in the Hellenistic world. When the Greeks spread throughout the Hellenistic kingdoms, they took their gods with them. But over a period of time, there was a noticeable decline in the vitality of the traditional Greek religion, which left Greeks receptive to the numerous religious cults of the Eastern world. The Eastern religions that appealed most to Greeks, however, were the mystery religions. What was the source of their attraction? Mystery cults, with their secret initiations and promises of individual salvation, were not new to the Greek world. But the Greeks of the Hellenistic era were also strongly influenced by Eastern mystery cults, such as those of Egypt, which offered a distinct advantage over the Greek mystery religions. The latter had usually been connected to specific locations, such as Eleusis, which meant that a would-be initiate had to undertake a pilgrimage in order to participate in the rites. In contrast, the Eastern mystery religions were readily available since temples to their gods and goddesses were located throughout the Greek cities of the East. All of the mystery religions were based on the same fundamental premises or premises. Individuals could pursue a path to salvation and achieve eternal life by being initiated into a union with a savior, god, or goddess who had died and had risen again. The Egyptian cult of Isis was one of the most popular mystery religions. Isis was the goddess of women, marriage, and children. As one of her hymns states, I am she who women call goddess. I ordained that women should be loved by men. I brought wife and husband together and invented the marriage contract. I ordained that women should bear children. Isis was also portrayed as the giver of civilization, who had brought laws and letters to all humankind. The cult of Isis offered a precious commodity to its initiates, the promise of eternal life. In many ways, the cult of Isis and the other mystery religions of the Hellenistic era helped pave the way for views and religions such as Christianity.